Hey there everybody, thanks for joining me for another one man review. Today I'm going to look at this newest and final volume of Kentaro Miura's Berserk in the Deluxe Editions from Dark Horse. This collects the material that goes right up to when Miura tragically died. I think everyone knows this now that he, he died before he was able to finish Berserk. So this gets up as far as he finished the series and then has some uh, additional material in the back that's really, really interesting and really compelling. I wanted to touch on this one just because, you know, this was one of the first books that got a lot of heat when me and Sean reviewed it together. I think me and Sean have got up to volume three reviewing together, but I've gone through and read the, the rest of the series on my own. So uh, really excited to get this one and really excited to be caught up with pretty much where everyone else is at, I think, who who's read it, uh, or at least up to the point where Muir was no longer able to keep working on his life masterpiece, which is pretty tragic. Um, so spoil spoilers will abound in this video. I want to just cover some of the beautiful things that are in it and talk about where the series wound up, at least as far as the original creator is concerned, and just my overall impressions of Berserk and its place in history, I think. So pretty pretty excited about this one. One of the things I like right out of the gate in this volume is, as usual, Mira will switch his art style depending on what's going on in the storyline and is constantly always trying new things. In, in this, in the previous volume, it's pretty obvious that he got a hold of and comfortable with working on computers, and that opened up a lot of possibilities in his art, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the worse. Uh, you can tell that personally for him it was probably for the worst because he's zooming relentlessly throughout the book. Uh, every little character in the background's got like finished face and every bit of their armor drawn in. So you you can see that maybe he was pushing himself a bit too hard. But at the beginning of the volume, especially, there's this really interesting experiment with drawing in white and on top of black and then adding grays on top of that. So you get a very like Gustave Doré almost approach to art where it looks like an old etching. Uh, some of the cross contour stuff and the cape is straight out of the Dante's Inferno plates. Uh, it, you always got to laugh at some of Miura's monsters too where they're like really obviously just big giant dicks. This one here as they piss it off even starts spitting at them. Um, so it's it's fun to see that he's still like being goofy with it after all of this time. For me, one of the big things about Berserk, and I know people have kind of laughed at me when I've said this before, is that it's always at its best when it's got this latent homoeroticism in it. And so this this scene, I think, is like a little over the top for me, but funny. Uh, but what I mean is that the tension between Guts and Griffith is always the most interesting part of the book to me. Um, and you know, when you see monsters like this, to me, it's kind of just acknowledging that he's bringing that element back. I think, even though as a design, this thing is just totally silly and, and ridiculous looking, but the way that he's painting with the tones in here and getting this wide variety of textures and stuff is pretty impressive. You can tell using the computer, he's able to get like a more fully rendered range of values and that brings him closer to like a more realistic almost painted version of his vision and I think that's pretty cool you're seeing him closer to the way it's in his head probably not all just having to make it out of marks that are black and white or the the gray tones but like these weird computer effects that's allowing him to get more of these foggy special effects going across things uh, that's really interesting. It's, it's pretty compelling to see throughout. And you get some of these just amazing images here where you do have these high contrast with all of these creatures that are black with the, the white being carved out on top and then the gray creature here and the white, the fire creature, all this different textural stuff. And then insane amount of work. Like even over here, you can't see it in the black, but these roiling vine things are just detailed all the way into the back and all of these characters here are like fully rendered with their costumes it's it's pretty nuts um i could see why his production slowed down once he got hold of a computer there's also some really cool design stuff that continuing to evolve where this is the first time that you see 
got totally taken over by the, the berserker armor where it becomes its own creature basically it, the the wolf form that it's always been headed towards but really cool design element where his big sword is the tail and it battles by spinning and chopping people with the tail so just really really cool design choices i mean miura is obviously one of the greatest like character and monster designers of all time Something else I really appreciate about his work is he'll saturate you for, I mean, pages and pages and pages with this really dark, gloomy, grotesque stuff. And he knows just instinctively when to switch. Like, when is this going to be too much, too oppressive? We need a breath of fresh air. And switch over to these really loose, open, light panels much thicker lines, much less detail, and the fact that he switches in and out of those things so successfully, and then is able to blend things that are almost stylistically opposite, is really, really impressive to me, and again leads to these just insane, like this one panel could be like a three-page fold-out spread in terms of the amount of work and detail that he's put in it, and not just only one of like five panels that have, you know, a ton of detail in them. So it's just absolutely an impressive feat of art. There's a lot of really important story moments in this, in, including the return of Casca as herself, rather than this like simple child-like character that she's been, this almost comatose character that she's been for so much of the series. This is going on in this fairy realm, and you get some really, again, beautiful design choices about designing the fairies. Tori and I have been really into watching this this reality contest show called Face Off where people do like monster makeups and creature makeups for movies in a competition setting. And I just reading this while also watching that, I can't help but want to see some of those spectacular effects artists get a hold of Miura's designs because he's such a fantastic designer. I, I don't know how this isn't something people are chasing. Like, I, I don't know, maybe they just won't sell the rights or whatever, but how like HBO is not chasing this as a replacement for Game of Thrones or Netflix or Amazon. I mean, you've got just such, you don't need concept designers. You've got a whole book full of concept designs and great stories in here. Uh, I, this is something I would love to see brought to the live action. I think it's his vision is just made for that. And you can tell with images like this where using these new computer tools, he's going for like a huge naturalistic range of value in his work. You can tell that in his mind, this is like real. It's not, it's never trying to be in a comic book style in his mind. I mean, there, there's certain places where obviously characters take on like here, different stylistic ticks, and this is much more comic booky and less realistic, but it's always for the visual design on the page. You can tell that he's swapping styles so that these things read well against each other. Like these characters having none of the grays on them, these much bigger feathered strokes versus all these like little, little Gustav Doré marks going on here, the little cross hatching. Uh, it's, it's a really different approach to the art, almost like Dave Gibbons looking in, in certain places. And then back to his normal with all the shading and all of that stuff in it there. And it allows the page to read really clearly, but you can tell in his brain that this stuff is supposed to exist more realistic looking like here where you see Zod, Nosferatu Zod, now that he's got the computer, it's a very different approach where it's much more painterly looking. It's very like full range of values in the fur. There's not much brushwork going on. And it looks much more like a 3D sculpted thing rather than a comic book drawing. And so I could see that once he's got those tools, like his art is skewing that way. And that's kind of what makes me think that this is how he's always wanted to draw Zod. He was just limited by the tools and so had a different approach. Now, I, I'm not sure that I prefer this. I quite like the the black and white starkness of how you have to draw that character with the bigger, brushier strokes. But it is really interesting to see his art evolve. And it's still beautiful to look at. It's just like almost like you have too many options. And it's sometimes nice to see someone like experiment within some constraints. But you just continue like this 
fully kind of painted image of Zod here. It's hard to hate on that, especially when it's butted up against all this beautiful stuff, this beautiful dragon here and Griffith looking so heroic. Um, this, this whole thing is just stunning. Stunning image after stunning image. His eye for composition. This, this is one of the things that I worry about. His studio continuing is that he, they may have enough people there that can kind of mimic his drawing style and his hatching techniques and know what he's doing with tones and stuff. But I'm not sure that you're going to have someone in your assistant base that really has this same vision. You know, this this world doesn't live in their head in the same way. And his design choices, whether it be the composition of a page or a costume, I'm not sure that's stuff that anyone in the studio could mimic as successfully. Uh, I, I want to know where Berserk goes. I want to know how the series is, ends. I don't know it will be his intended ending. But I do want to know. I'm just skeptical. Like, can it have the same quality without the guy who's been driving it for, you know, 30 years? Someone who has the design sensibilities to take the H.R. Giger effect of just these like ribby structures going up things with lots of mechanical repetitions and turn it into something this beautiful uh you know i just i just don't know maybe all of these things are designed and they can just use use those and have the artists recreate them but i worry about that i'm curious i know berserk has still been being re released i don't read it as it comes out or anything like that so if someone can tell me how consistent the studio has been able to be with the design work and the, the sense of scale and the sense of composition. I'd be interested to hear that. But in this book, you get basically Casca coming back to herself. You get Griffith really seeing his vision for his kingdom to come together. And he's talking about humanity's realm in the midst of all this awful magic that's going on, all this dark magic. And he's building the second empire. In these panels, you can see a lot of what I'm talking about with the zoom. Like this panel here, you're not going to be able to see it on camera, but if you were to zoom in, the characters in the back have just as rendered faces as the characters in the front. They're 100% the original characters, and it's, you know, like a tenth of my fingernail. Same thing for this dark character here. He's, he's cramming so much in, it, it's absolutely insane. But Griffith's Empire's developing... Guts is with Casca in the fairyland. There's an unfortunate little mechanism that he puts in the story here that, that's going to complicate their relationship is they really obviously love each other and want to see each other, but Casca can't see Guts without bringing up the memories of what happened to her in the, the first Eclipse event and the volume four of the deluxe edition. So she can't remember that without shutting back down. She's got to slow work her way into that. So she really has to be away from seeing Guts. She can hear him, but she can't see him. And some of these images here of her having those memories boil over on top of him are really, really viscerally nasty, but also gut-wrenching, no, no pun intended. A lot of, again, really cool design decisions. Just this crazy stone mushroom forest that they're going into to meet this troll guy. This is the guy who made the armor for both the Knight on the Horse and the Berserker armor. Yeah, I really feel like Mira must have been getting close to the finish of the story. It's like everything's coming together. All the elements are there. You feel like uh, Guts' evolution into the Berserker is about as complete as it gets. Griffith has accomplished his empire and it feels like he's ready to go to the next stage Casca's back really really feels like we're heading towards the end there which makes it even sadder that Miura wasn't able to finish it himself we're getting back like the god hand here but without Griffith as part of it there's the, they're not the same characters I, w I would have liked to know more about that and got to the point where you kind of kick off in the first volume where Guts is going up the stairs and Griffith's at the top as one of these characters. Um, that relationship between the two of them, what started out as like this homoerotic friendship that causes Guts to, you know, set out on this quest. And like, I, I, I'm invested in that personal story and I want to see it come to fruition. And it feels like we're getting really close to that. Just some more bit 
visual beauty here with these flowers and this runic stone the night this is another one that could be its whole own like you know two page spread worth of detail and stuff in one panel and then you get just as much detail in some of the other panels Again, Miura knows when to flip into the fun. At first, this was off-putting to me because the first four volumes were so serious, really. I didn't see anything magical and cartooning. But I've come to really appreciate and enjoy the humor that he throws into it because he is painting a full picture of the world. It's not always all dark and bleak or nostalgic and sad and depressed there's characters that are having fun in the world and i think that's important and it really shows what a master artist he has become in that he's handling this type of cartooning so so well mixed in with the you know type of imagery like this he's just able to fluidly combine so many different approaches and styles and it feels naturalistic and also have fun like this character here is always having now like a little Yoda character, calling him a Padawan. So he's just mixing in stuff and having fun and I think probably keeping it from getting too bleak for himself. There's even a Jar Jar Binks in there. That's that's one of the things too that I find really interesting about this is his his cultural breadth is so wide it's not limited to to Japan or anything like that. So it allows him to get a really full worldview of all these different kind of creatures and stuff. This is another example of, you know, something that could be like a four page pullout spread all on its own, every character. And also there's like three levels to the story that's going on in here. So I get the sense that he's really trying to speed things up and that like this interaction could be its own panel. What the witches are talking about is another kind of story and there's little fairies going on back here. There's just so much going on in any one of these panels. It could almost be a page in itself, which for how decompressed this manga and most manga is, is very interesting. The, the most compelling thing in this volume is this child that's been showing up, this long dark haired child that always shows up on the full moons and has saved everyone a couple times. Never talks, is a bit mysterious, seems drawn to Casca, almost like a mother figure, is playing around with Guts. My impression is that this is the child of Guts and Casca. We'll talk about that a bit more at the end. Because here we're moving into what is the final sequence for uh, Miura. This is the last thing he inked before he died, before he passed. And it's actually a pretty touching ending. I, I guess it could be a touching ending where you realize that this child that, that's always coming to them is probably, well, definitely the child that Casca had when she was in the, that she was impregnated with during the first eclipse of it. Now, I haven't reread this all, but my memory is this would have been Griffith's child from the rape that happens during that scene. But there's kind of an implication that this is somehow Guts's kid, or at least that he would be the father to it. And then you, that it's responding to him like a father at least. Then you get this sequence where she's having this memory and her dream of having the child while in that event that she's trying to forget. This is definitely Casca's child. And then you get Guts coming out and watching the child the child disappears and is replaced by griffith and the the thing that's written here at the end is like i said kind of a beautiful ending potentially this vague open ending but uh casca goes running outside and says i was dreaming on nights of the full moon i'd become a or actually no i believe that what this is this is a little confusing because you don't get the follow-up to this but i think what's happening here is the dark haired child seems to be getting bigger and his hair is turning blonde and you can see the darkness at the very tips of the blonde and then he's saying i was dreaming on nights of the full moon, I'd become a small child and find myself embraced by nostalgic warmth. But when I wake from the dream, all that remains is a faint scent of loneliness that too soon fades away along with a single tear like morning dew. So what's happening here is I, I think what happened is that 
as Griffith ascended to the God Hand and raped Casca, he basically, that's his way of coming back to Earth is he's born through her, I think, is what the suggestion here is. I would have to go back and reread the whole thing to really get it. So people who have are not just reading this for the first time and know exactly what's going on, I'd love to hear from you. But I think that he's basically like cloned himself through her and he on full moons will turn into this child that goes and helps and protects his old friends. And that's what he's saying. He's, he's embraced by nostalgic warmth, like his love for Guts and Casca from the Band of the Hawk days is carrying them over. But Griffith is always such a like narcissistic, sociopathic manipulator. It's weird to think about him as needing to be embraced by nostalgic warmth and to see him in their like little safe place that they're in in this fairy village is unsettling that he like disappears from his duties and goes and bees a child for one or two nights uh, is interesting and now that he's in the fairy village that's allowing him because time slowed down he was able to spend more time with them but this is all definitely like heading towards some kind of culmination as far as i can tell and it's really, really just an absolute tragedy that Miura never got to play this out. And for me, as someone who's most interested in the triangle between Casca, Guts, and Griffith, and Griffith's narcissistic manipulations and the homoerotic best friends competitive thing going on between Guts and Griffith, uh, it's, yeah, that's the thing that's most compelling to me. And whenever it comes back, is when I most want to continue reading the story. When it's just these side missions, it's fun, but it's not as compelling to me. And so this is now getting to the thing that I've been waiting for for the whole series is like wrapping back around to that first volume where Griffith has ascended and Guts has brought himself up as a potentially a worthy competitor. Uh, so if anyone can tell me also if it seems like we're headed towards that in the stuff that the studio is releasing, I would like to know that as well. I'm also hoping that as that material gets finished and they have enough for another one of these hardcovers that they will continue to release it in this format. For those people like me who have only read it in this format, um, even if it's not Miura's work, it would be nice to have the whole thing once it's finished all in the hardcovers because I do want to see where it goes. I know it's not his, but I feel like I can accept this as Mir's ending. Like even this little bit about dreams seems to have this thing that he's talking about where like this is the thing that he awakes from every now and then that he gets this respite of waking into regular life, you know, once every now and then, but then he, wakes from the dream or this is the dream i guess like berserk is the dream and he spends all of his time in that he he is the griffith character in a sense that's on this mission to create this big beautiful thing and every now and then he gets to wake up from that but when he does when he comes back to his real life all that remains is a faint sense of sense of loneliness and I mean, to pour yourself into a work like this, there must be a faint sense of loneliness in the real world. And that too soon fades away as you go back into the work and, you know, you pour your life into this, the, the loneliness fades away. And, you know, in this single tear, like, I, I don't know, this is just one of those things where if if the creator had to die, you couldn't end on a better final page for that creator than this. And so I can really comfortably, I think, accept like that more metaphorical, poetic ending to things where I can fill in as that's the end of Mira's version, and the, but still get another satisfying conclusion written by someone who has his notes. I think I can appreciate that. I think I could be okay with that. So I'm, I'm interested in it. I, I want to read it, and hopefully it will be in volumes like this. Then to fill this out and make it the right size, they have this entire like berserk guidebook in the back this seems like something that actually got made in between the two volumes that are collected in this book the things that it's referencing is like what's coming up in the story are talking about things that unfold in the second of the two volumes collected in here volume so it seems like this got released after volume 40 that to me i guess i'm not like 
I'm not the type of person who's going to read a guidebook, but it's just so impressive the amount of ideas he has attached to even throwaway characters. I do think this could be something that if I read it and then went back and reread the series, I would have such a deeper understanding of it and it would get me closer to like how he experiences this world in his head, which is with a series like this, how I want to experience it as close to this movie playing out in the creator's head as possible. So the, just the insane amount of information that he must have been holding in his head to make decisions even about what any character is going to do is wildly impressive. But what really, really struck me in this and what I was most excited about is that they have a very lengthy interview with Kentaro Miura uh, commemorating the arrival at Elf Island. So this is a, a, an interview that happened before, like the, right as the material in this volume was happening, I guess. And just really, really insightful stuff to see from the outside, uh, to hear what he was thinking about with everything, like his decision making. And the thing that I took away is he's such a keen observer of archetypes and story archetypes and what makes things work in movies. He's, he's here talking about uh, looking at Star Wars, he said, I once heard in some documentary, if you want to make a movie that rivals Star Wars, you can't watch Star Wars. Go watch what George Lucas was watching for the purpose of making Star Wars. Follow what's already been depicted and you might just end up with an inferior copy. So here you have him saying like, look, don't go back to the last, to the thing that you like, find out what those people liked and then find out what those people like. So he's talking about like digging, excavating back into the history of narrative and really situating what he's done here as this meta mythological narrative that draws from all these sources and combines them and squeezes the juice out of them. And that really is why this book is so successful is because he so successfully like essentializes and squeezes the juice out of so many other powerful things that he's now pouring all of that together in this great mix. And he keeps going back to these ideas in this interview, which is really, really cool. Here is something really sad in retrospect. To everyone who's been reading along since the old days, Berserk is still moving ahead as it always has. I suspect you drift away at times when gaps open up in the serialization schedule, but please come back when you get curious. I'm still here working on Berserk, and I want to maintain my health as I somehow make it to the conclusion, as ever, here's to the future. Which is so sad. That's like the end of the interview, I think, right? Yeah, this is the end of the interview. And he's talking about, like, trying to maintain his health because he knows that he's running out of time, it seems like. And I think that's what the speed up is about as well is I, I got to somehow make it to the conclusion. And that that statement there, I somehow make it to the conclusion, is really sad to me. This is someone that's like probably has a, a five more lifetimes worth of characters he wishes he could delve into, their backstory. You know, there's so much to this world in his head that's not in here. You can see that in the guidebook that he would probably love to have, yeah, 10 more lifetimes to fully explore the world, but also knows he's only got this one and we got to wrap it up and give some conclusion to the readers before I die because I don't want to leave my thing hanging. And then he wasn't able to do that. So it just is extra sad, adds to the tragedy. But I'm really, really grateful that this was translated and, and published in this volume. You also get a pretty cool look at his studio here, what his workspace is like, all the sketches on the wall that he's working from, old manuscripts here, old pages. This is a look at his reference books, all of the medieval stuff that he's got around European lifestyle that he's got. There's some character turnarounds, which are really cool. It's, it's really impressive to see him turn these characters around. It's impressive to see him strip them of their clothes like how well he knows the body type of each one, how well he knows their posture. Like right here, it says, Isidro is a punk. So when he walks, please have him round his back and bow his legs a little bit. This is for a game, I believe, but it, or an animation maybe. So he's giving all of these character notes, all these things that he knows. 
each of his expressions is brimming with naughtiness. It's fun just to see the design of his pants or the way he walks like a punk in these rough sketches. So there's so much of that kind of detail in here as well. It's just a really impressive, you know, it just adds to how impressive Miura is as, as an artist and a, a fantasist, someone whose imagination is pretty, pretty unrivaled. You know, there's other artists who can do this kind of stuff, but I don't think there's anyone else who has ever fully realized a fantastical vision to this level of quality in the art. I don't think there's ever been someone else to put this much meaningful character development into this type of story, these meta myths, like er everything about it. I, I get it, you know, like the people that rant and rave about Berserk, I didn't get it in the first couple volumes, but as I have continued to read the series, I've gone through these waves of, like I said, if, if it goes off into like just an adventure for a while where we got to go beat some sea creatures and there's no forward motion in the emotional story, I personally get kind of tired with it, but I get why Miura also thinks you need to jump back and forth between these different emotional states, you know, the darker, the lighter, the depressing, the happier, the silly, I, I get why all that happens, but I'm always most excited when it gets back to the core story. But seeing the totality of it, um, I, I get why all those things happen. It's really hard for me to imagine the mindset of someone in Japan who's been reading this since they were a kid and has like followed it all the way through. It's hard for me to imagine people sitting for like years on one of these storylines that's off of the main arc. I can't imagine what that experience would be. I'm really glad I'm reading it in these collected volumes and can, you know, rush through it really quickly because that lets me see the total map a little bit better. I think reading it monthly, it would be easier to feel like you were getting lost a little bit, like uh, he's way off track. This is never going to be good again, but it always comes back to the core. So yeah, absolutely. One of the best comics ever, a, a fantastic thing, a, a tragic death. Uh, probably, probably partially caused by the fact that each one of these characters is its own full page spread worth of detail and it's just in the background probably wasn't helping him and the stress of trying to get this thing done and the, the isolation of just working on this I, I can't imagine it, but for him not to be able to finish it is is a real real tragedy and a real loss for all of us but a masterpiece, an absolute masterpiece, something I, now that I, well, I, I don't know, I kind of like wait for it to be finished, finished, but I would really love to just blow through like on a couple, like, like take a week and just have a, a berserk fest where I just binge the whole, a berserk binge would be great. Um, so thank you for Dark Horse, thank you to Dark Horse for producing these in such large volumes. This is something that definitely deserved it. And thank you so much to Kentaro Miura for the gigantic body of work and for pouring your life into this because it's it's a really beautiful thing and it's a tragedy that that he didn't get to complete it. Sorry if I spoiled a bunch of stuff, uh, but if, if you haven't read Berserk, you should go read it. It's really good. And for those of you who have read it, you probably know better than me why this is so special. And I yeah, I would really love to hear from you all about how it how it's going with his studio taking over. And what you thought about uh, the relationship, like with Griffin, Guts, and Casca at the end of this book, like who who that kid is, like is he Guts' child or Griffith's child? Um, I have, like I said, I've only read this once through, so I feel like I'm missing some of that that rereads would make more clear.
Make sure to like, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell.